question of is it going to be credit and the loosening of credit that will save us if what you're saying is true that it was credit that got us into this problem that well, was partly know. the suppression of wages the fact that people didn't have the ability the workforce didn't have the ability to consume the products that right. needed well, you can consuming. get everybody in the country an equity line of a hundred thousand dollars but <laughs> then you know what's going to go uh, be well, they've got to pay it back most people think well i've already hocked up with debt i mean so, debt is not so you Usually in a major, major crisis, what you do is you wipe, eradicate debt. You just hyperinflate the debt away or you just, they're not talking about doing that. Mm. They are giving the banks the ability to extend credit. They're wiping out the bank debt by paying for it. But the whole area is there that they're stuck with, like AIG, you know, which is a part of the, you know, this vast uh, insurance, reinsurance uh, paper, which has been issuing all this, these endlessly complicated, uh, you know, uh, mutations of money. I mean, one of the reasons it happened is that, I mean, profit, they had to try and slice out profit in more and more elaborate ways to make a buck. And so that's why you had the selling of debt and the multiplication of debt and the multiplication of the multiplication to a level where people literally, when the house of cards goes down, you don't know what the debt is. Mm. They, they take mm. days trying to figure it out. So the balloon went so wide in an effort to keep the whole show on the road. And of course, people made berserk sums of money that the deflation is going to take a very long time before people even figure out the magnitude of the affair. And just to remind us, David, why yeah. did we need debt to keep the show on the road? Um, well, in the 1970s, uh, you started attacking the living standards of working people. And real wages have not risen around the world very much since the 1970s. And if real wages are not rising, then you've got a problem in who do you sell your product to? Uh, so real wages didn't rise, so you had to go to the credit card and the debt, and so you increased household debt, not only in this country, but pretty much uh, anywhere around the world where you could do it. So the result of that was we had a debt-fueled economy. I mean, household debt has tripled over the last uh, 20 years. And if household debt is doing that and household wages are doing that, then the gap becomes bigger and bigger, and there comes a point where you can't possibly uh, pay back. And so there is, if you like, the problem. But by the way, uh, the latest estimate I saw, which came in a, only a couple of days ago, says that $50 trillion worth of wealth have already been wiped out in the global economy. So it's actually the wipeout is going pretty fast right now. And that's the other thing is that rich people, and rich people got very much richer after the 1970s or so, they don't necessarily invest in production. They invest in assets, they, their asset values. So they, houses. And, and houses. But the interesting thing is all of those markets are Ponzi-like markets without Madoff at the top. Mm -hmm. You invest in housing, housing goes up in price. And so you think, oh, this is a good investment. So more people invest in housing. And so it goes up in price again. So that's where the asset bubble comes from. But we haven't actually helped anybody pay any of those absolutely, prices. Absolutely, absolutely not. So, so you're doing two things at the same time. The richer investing in asset values not investing in production, so you're not getting an expansion of production, and wages are constant, and so, you know, this thing was coming mm. for a long time, and it should have been seen as coming for a long time. And my objection to people like Geithner and Summers and all the rest of it, they were there in the years when it was really coming, and they should have seen it, and they didn't. But a comprehensive program would require getting over some ideological barriers. We oh. have some big ideological barriers about a comprehensive uh, yes. plan, a government plan, and That's, even that deficit That is a major spending. problem. I mean, we, when Roosevelt was in 33, 34, 35, and, you know, he was pushed to the left. But there was a left there to come forward out of the Communist Party, out of the Trotskyist groups, out of, you know, a whole left culture. Now, what have you got? I mean, the left is, there's not much of a left left, so to speak. I mean, in the 1970s, I used to go to the Union of Radical Political Economists summer conferences. There were three or four hundred people in the room. Yeah. I mean, now you look around, you see how many left radical political economists are there, which you, I co-edit a website which has three million unique viewers a month. We are desperate to have guys write for us. So, I mean, our most popular Paul writer is Paul Craig Roberts, who's a sort of radical populist now. He was in the Reagan, Reagan Treasury. I mean, you've got Mark Weisbrot, you've got, uh, you know, Dean Baker, you, you know, you've got great writers like David, but very few. And what does that point to? It points that you're you need people who can go into government and suddenly start running major programs. Are you going to take the Wall Street? Now, maybe in the Wall Street bankers are some of the people who used to be in the Union of Radical Political Economists and went out and made a buck. Maybe they can go back in. But you have to call. You have to have a talent pool there. And I, the talent pool is pretty shallow. Mm. 
if we don't get our if we don't shift ideologically in this country what happens uh, you lay out the, the very different situation in china yes. as they address their problems their ideological bents are exactly the opposite yes, yes. well they have, they have the advantage i mean every time uh, obama is accused of being socialist he goes very querulous and kind of says like this whereas can you imagine the chinese communist party quaking in their shoes because somebody called them socialist i mean at least they have that ideological advantage and we got all of these ideological configurations i mean one of them also is this fixation on home ownership as a way to house people. And I think there are clear limits to that. And we should start thinking about, you know, uh, municipal housing associations and things of that kind, which house people in a different way, financing housing in a different kind of way. But we can't think about anything other than where we have been. And Deficit so, spending. You have a commitment to a balancing the budget yes. coming out of Barack Obama. Yes. Well, that's, that was a crazy kind of comment. I mean, on the one hand, you're going to huge deficits, and on the other hand, you're promising to balance the budget. Doesn't make doesn't make sense. I think Obama, yeah. I mean, every now and again, he, I think he's more available to left pressure than Clinton was. I mean, uh, if, if these labor guys, if it was true, they said, you know, you start talking about Social Security reform, we're out of here. I think that if, if people, it is a repush. I mean, on another level, when the DEA started arresting, um, raiding medical marijuana facilities in California, and they're, and they're all the, do, uh, the medical marijuana people, they, you know, it's 13 states. Don't forget that the, what was the first act that Roosevelt did in the, in the New Deal was there was the repeal of prohibition. Get them into the bars, I guess, get them off the streets too. Yes. But Obama promptly told Holder, uh, uh, at Miracle. the DOJ, the Justice Department, to pull the DEA off it, and they've pledged to. We've actually effectively had legalization of medical, mar medical marijuana. It's a pretty big deal. Pressure from the left works. We just need more of it. Well, yes. we need to have real plans, Absolutely. constructive plans. The left has to think awful big. Alexander Coburn, thanks so much. Counterpunch is the newsletter. David Harvey, thank you. We'll have links to several of David Harvey's articles at our website. We're just kicking off a conversation. I hope you'll continue it where you are. I'm Laura Flanders. This is Grid TV. Thanks for joining us.